So actually, Henry Ratnik, uh, and uh, he's going to talk about AI and cybersecurity. And he is, by the way, also attorney at the law uh, and go head of IT IP law at Wyden Legal. So the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you. So um, let's talk about AI. Woohoo! Everybody's favorite subject. So I'm going to. AI and cybersecurity, and uh, more about AI. And I'm going to talk about the common pitfalls which should be and could be avoided by businesses using AI tools or regular people using AI, for example, in their schoolwork or whatever they want to do with it. Um, as any good presentation starts with a long introduction of the presenter, uh, that's me. My name is Henry. Uh, I am capable of wearing a suit, as it, as it can be seen from the picture. Uh, as said, I'm an attorney at law, head of the co, uh, a co head of the IT IP practice at uh, law firm Wyden. I studied in Tartu, so it's good to be back here. And I'm a lawyer by day, but a tech nerd by night. So I love doing IT law. Mm. So um, the question is why? The question is why we are talking about AI and why we are talking about law. Uh, and the simple answer is because AI is very popular. And this is no surprise to anyone. Of course, we know that AI is popular. People are talking about ChatGPT almost every day. But uh, I want to draw your minds to the fact that um, everybody knows Instagram, Instagram app. Uh, it took two and a half years for Instagram to gain 100 million active users. The same took TikTok nine months, but ChatGPT reached 100 million active users just with two months. So this is a very clear example that AI is very popular, everybody is using it, and this is why we should talk about also the legal stuff. Um, in my short presentation here today, I want you to take home four legal things to know when using AI, whether you're using it as a company, as a regular person, or however. And the first thing I want to tell you is kind of obvious, read the terms. Every AI tool comes with terms and conditions. It's a, it's a contract, you should read it. When you rented your apartment, for example, you read the rental contract probably. When you bought your house or you're going to buy it someday, then you're probably going to read that contract as well, right? So you should also read the terms and conditions which, which come with the, with the AI tool. Um, thing is that you are not probably able to negotiate them because they do not come in a word draft. You just see the PDF or wall of text on online. But the thing why you should read them is that it gives you the understanding of the risks that you are involved in and you know your rights and obligations. And if the terms are very bad, extremely bad, and we are going to talk about it in a few minutes, then you know you shouldn't use that AI tool. For example, choose another AI tool in that case. Um, and you also know for what to use it for. For example, you want to do pictures there, you want to create a song on, with AI tools, you want to process text or whatever. And if those terms and conditions, you read them, you do not understand anything. You do not understand anything because they are complex, they are long, they are 20 pages long, ah. Then perhaps don't use them. The second thing is uh, what can I put into the AI system? And you can quote uh, me on that, but uh, AI is like a bowl of soup on this picture. It's like a bowl of soup. You put some stuff in and something goes into the pot, you know, you're not very sure because sometimes it's a black box, it's like a soup, you know, and uh, then a bunch of stuff comes out. Mm. The question what you should ask is, what can I put into the AI tool so I would actually own this stuff? So, for example, if I want to, if I want to write a poem, I write a poem, I want ChatGPT to make it better. ChatGPT, dear ChatGPT, please write that poem better. Or I will take a picture of Big Ben, very originally, using my iPhone or whatever, and I say to the AI tool, please Photoshop it to make it better, remove the clouds or whatever. Then the question is, do I still own the intellectual property rights of that photograph or that poem? And this depends. You have to read the terms to understand it. Some AI tools, terms, say that whatever you put into the AI, you will lose the rights. 
It's not very common, but some AI tools have it. For example, ChatGPT is a very reasonable program in that sense because it tells that you still own your rights when you put some stuff into the ChatGPT. Another question is, um, is confidentiality guaranteed? For example, I have a headache. Uh, I have a headache, I feel bad, uh, my, my throat is hurting. What's wrong with me? Dear ChatGPT, please tell me, do I have some serious health issues? So the question is whether it's confidential or will this kind of stuff go online? So you should also be worried about whether the stuff is, is confidentially covered, whatever I put in there. And I'm not talking about only illnesses, but for example, if you're like drafting a contract and you want to use AI tool to help you draft the contract, then this kind of data that you put into the AI tool is kind of confidential and kind of sensitive. So you should read the terms to understand whether they uh, guarantee the confidentiality. Also, good old GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation from the EU, this also applies. Because much of the AI tools are developed and uh, they are run from US servers, you should also ask the question whether I can actually send any personal data there. For example, if I want to use the AI tool for my business, for example, I'm an accountant, I want to calculate uh, the salaries next month for my employees. Can I put their uh, wages data into the AI tool? Can I put their names in the AI tool to help me calculate this stuff? You should, you should look at the terms and understand whether the GDPR is covered in the terms and conditions of the AI tool. So we talked about what to put into the AI tool, but since the AI tool is like a bowl of soup, something also comes out. It can be, can be the soup. So the, the question here is, the third question is, what can I actually do with the AI output which I gain from, from the AI tool. For example, I asked AI to write me a song, I asked AI tool to write me a poem, uh, a contract, whatever. The thing is that this kind of output, which is created and which is original, like poems, like photographs, like songs, are usually protected with copyright laws. It is an age-old argumentation whether uh, something that is created by robots can actually be protected by copyright laws. But let's not get into that. This is a very specific uh, discussion. But usually it is. Usually when AI tool pushes out a song, pushes out a poem or whatever, this is usually protected by the copyright laws. And this kind of copyright is owned by the, originally by the uh, operator of the AI tool. For example, OpenAI for ChatGPT. So the question is, can I use this stuff for my personal use? For example, uh, you want to write a poem uh, to your uh, dear loved husband or wife, uh, can I do it? Or for example, I, I, I asked the AI to wrote me a song, can I, can I put this song on my mobile phone and let my friends hear it because it's funny? Yeah, usually you can. You can use this kind of stuff for your personal use, usually. But you have to read the terms again. But can I use this stuff professionally? For example, if I run a news media outlet, for example, we have a TV show and I want to make uh, uh, a song for the TV show, can I ask AI tool to do it? Yeah, you can, but the question is, can I use it on the TV as well? Do I own the rights to use this song on professional grounds? And this depends on the terms and conditions of that specific AI tool. For example, if you look at the terms of mid-journey, you will find that you can use this stuff professionally only if you pay them, only if you use the paid subscription of the mid-journey program. For ChatGPT, it doesn't, uh, it, there is no difference. You can still use it. So it really, really depends on the AI tool. This is why you have to read the terms. Um, and there are also other rules what to keep in mind, but I, I will not go into them because we do not have enough time. And the fourth thing I want to tell you about today here is who is liable? Who is liable when uh, you know what hits the fan? Because um, it's always you. You are using the AI tool. And if you read those terms and conditions of the AI tool, then you find that they, they do not, they're not liable for anything, basically. You are the user of the AI tool. You should acknowledge that the AI tool can make mistakes. Uh, and that's it. So you are liable for whatever you use the AI tool. And you 
often find surprising liability caps from these terms and conditions. For example, if you read the ChatGPT terms and conditions, you will find that they are never liable for more than 100 US dollars. So for example, if you, if you are a programmer and you work with uh, AI tools to write the program, for example, with ChatGPT, uh, you're doing it as your employment task. And if something turns out is wrong with the program and somebody suffers a lot of damage, then ChatGPT is not liable for this stuff. You are. So AI makes mistakes. Don't trust it completely. Again, kind of obvious thing to say, but it is as obvious as my recommendation to read the terms because surprising stuff may come out of there. And that's it. These were my four recommendations. Thank you very much. So uh, from my side here, uh, yeah, it, it works now. Good. Um, all right. Uh, so a couple of questions also before I will leave you here in a stage with also with the panel discussion as well. Um, how worried are lawyers about AI taking their jobs? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's, it's, it shouldn't be a worry. It should be more uh, of uh, using AI in our work because um, uh, Working as a lawyer means that we have to go lots of documents at some stages of our work. For example, there is 100 pages of, of contract and your client is saying, uh, does it have any problems? What should I be wary of? If I put this contract into the AI, I will get the answer with one minute and the AI will tell me something. But what's the quality of that answer? That's the problem. So I think, it's, I think the question is not that AI will take our jobs, but how we can use AI to make our jobs easier, quicker, and perhaps even cheaper. My uh, like philosophical thinking here is that perhaps AI helps uh, law uh, to bring law more to masses. Like more people can access legal services because it gets cheaper because lawyers are using AI. Uh -huh. Um, so a bit related question, uh, partly. <laughs> uh, how might AI change the landscape of courtroom arguments and legal defenses? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a funny thing. Actually, what I have been seeing lately, uh, I actually saw it today morning, that uh, when we are drafting contracts and negotiating uh, with uh, counterparties of the agreement, I have myself, I have my client, and then we have the counterparty. And the counterparty does not have a lawyer, but the clauses provided with them, contract clauses, are so well written, like it's perfect English, but they do not understand the content because they use the AI for, for drafting it. So I think it, it, might, it might lead us to a point where people are using AI to, uh, to argue with each other, and then we end up like AI arguing with AI because AI yeah, reads the arguments and drafts the arguments. So it's kind of, kind of funny thing. And that's like never-ending arguments in that Basically, way. Basically, yeah. And everything is in very polite English. Yeah. Well. <laughs> All right. But, uh, but thank you very much. And